Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a powerful panel, and uh, we're just going to go improv here. It's a little intimidating because um, these are some strong women <laughs> with a lot of knowledge, and uh, I have an Ogallala uncle from back in Lakota country that talked about the, the women as caretakers, and really it's not too much of man's business to be around that, so I'm nervous. <laughs> but um, thank you, Margo, for, your, for teeing us up with that great presentation, especially that last slide that uh, we were happy to have our hands in that project um, in partnership with the Klamath tribes, um, with the Nature Conservancy and the Forest Service and our organization, tribally led project that Margo talked about. And when we think about recovery um, in the context of uh, indigenous communities, it's, it's gonna be a little different than some of the conversations we've been having today. So that's what we hope to um, tease out. And thinking about recovery, it's with the ecosystem as the Home Depot, the pharmacy, the grocery store, and the church, uh, a very different context of, of the dominant worldview. So we look forward to hearing from our um, team here, and we'll start with Belinda Brown um, from the co-selected band of the Ajumawi Atsugay Nation and Northern Paiute Gadutigid, where we're just experiencing a fire last week on uh, reservation lands there. And I'll be honest, we didn't queue up questions because that's what we've been doing right before we came. We almost weren't going to make it. But here we are, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marco, and thank you, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. And as I was sitting here listening to everybody, I, I see myself aligning probably more with health and human services because that is my background. I'm a member of the Co-Selecta Band of the Ajumawi Atsugay Nation, otherwise known as the Pitt River Tribe. And I'm also uh, Gadutikid, Northern Paiute, and Isleta Pueblo. And like Margo was saying, our people have been taking care of this land, this landscape for time immemorial. And I've been jokingly saying we get the big I told you so award right now <laughs> because we do know what to do. And, and at, unfortunately, the, the ceremonial ways, the rituals, the ways of our people, when the colonizers first came, um, they were demonized and, and they, they didn't let us practice our ceremonies. And when I think about centering indigenous knowledge and indigenous traditional ecological knowledge, it begins with ceremony. And a lot of that ceremony begins with fire. So in our sweat lodge ceremonies and our Native American church ceremonies, and just think about your own experience with fire that's been good. And I know there's been a lot of bad experience with fire, but what Margo says is correct. Fire is medicine for the land, and fire is actually medicine for us. So, so we need to embrace it in a way that we haven't thought about embracing fire and putting fire back on the land in a good way, like you just saw in that picture of the bootleg fire. So now that picture that you saw that was all green, now cultural fire can go back in that area. Fire just went through there, it cleaned it out, it survived, so it works. So we do have best practices, we do have active management, we do have active treatments that work. So maybe we haven't always had those best practices, maybe we haven't always had the best science, in order to, to put these practices into work, but now we do. And now we know that we need to all come together because we're all, like one of our elders used to say in Ashland, we're all in this leaky canoe together. And so it doesn't really matter what color earth suit that you're wearing when, it, when we're talking about equity, we're talking about a, a crisis and a chaos that we're all responsible for now and that we all should have a hand in helping each other and helping the ecosystem. For our people, the indigenous aboriginal people of this land, we've been under ecocide and genocide for a long time. And now our, 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 our people that are here are feeling that. Our villages were burned out here in California many, many years ago. Some of the villages that are being burned out now were burned out previously. Our people had their 9-11 and nobody came. And so you folks are all lucky 
that there's somebody coming, that there's somebody that cares, that somebody got the fire inside of them to put these nonprofits together that are responding to your community needs. And that's really, really important because that connection with the land, that connection with the ceremony, if you can think of a time when you had fire in your life that it was special, maybe that wood stove burning, maybe grandma and grandpa's house, maybe a campfire out in the woods, and how it draws people together, it can still do that. And guess what, it did that. It drew everybody here together today. And that's, I believe, what it's all about. And coming back to the indigenous, aboriginal, traditional ecological knowledge, and the scientists, and the lay people, and the congressmen, and the Indians, they're all talking. That's what we want to see more of, because that's how we're going to heal. Our people need to tell their story. That's what I know. In order to heal, they need to tell their story. And so thank you, everybody, today for telling your story. Thank you, Belinda. Turn it over to you, Trina. All right. Sasakati Nikki Heskum. My name is Trina Cunningham. I am the executive director of the Maidu Summit Consortium. I am Mountain Maidu um, and was born in my, and, and still live in my ancestral lands. Our ancestral lands are just north and, or uh, south and east of the Pitt River Tribe, so we're between the Pitt River Tribes and uh, Lake Tahoe, just in northeastern California. Last year, uh, we've been working on, I've been personally working on land and uh, water and fire issues for a long time and have done multiple presentations to the state legislature and other federal decision makers saying exactly what Margot said, that uh, fire and water are inseparable. If you want healthy forests, you have to, if you want healthy water, you have to have um, healthy forests. And in our homelands, um, 2.1 million acres are owned by the federal government, yet we supply 27 million Californians with water, which are state and um, privately owned water companies. And so um, we've really been urging more investment of, of water utilities and downstream water users into, into headwaters communities for the benefit of the forest and ecosystem benefit. And um, we've been working, and, and tribal people, like I, my dad, you know, he's, um, he's very retired and has been for a while now, and he asks me what I'm doing and what I'm working on, and he says, oh, you're doing what I was doing when I was your age, and it's actually, you know, pretty depressing. Like, we're still trying to do the same thing our parents and our grandparents were trying to do, and Finally, at this point, I feel like we're, as tribal communities, are beginning to get leverage. Um, last year in 2021, we um, experienced, and it's still <laughs> raw for anybody who's experienced wildfire, the destruction of your communities, you know how raw that is. And so we experienced, um, a 960,000 acre wildfire in our ancestral homeland that burnt into the Pitt River homelands. It burnt through um, parts of five counties and um, completely devastated several communities. And tribally, we're struggling in, in a lot of different ways. We had a Maidu Summit Consortium board meeting yesterday, and uh, we also um, just closed on our sixth property in April of this year. And so as a nonprofit tribal organization, intertribal organization, because all of our board members represent different tribal um, tribes and tribal organizations in our homelands, um, we now own three, almost 3,000 acres of our own homelands. Yeah. So, so hurrah. Yeah. Um, About 2,600 of those acres burned in the Dixie Fire. And there was another fire burning on the eastern side of our homelands at the same time the Dixie Fire was burning. So it was well over a million acres of our ancestral homelands. And so as I explained to our, our board, we were, were faced with like 650 acres of dead standing trees in in forests, and as Margot said, some of those trees needed to 
go <laughs> because they were encroaching or in places that they shouldn't be growing. Um, but we, the impact to our communities, you know, having, having the health care centers burned down, the Indian health services that serve not just the tribal people but the whole communities, having the Indian education center burned down, um, and, and we're a tight-knit small community and so it affects everybody and looking at how to rebuild those, those, that infrastructure, um, our, our tribal citizens have been displaced um, since pretty much since 1849 in the gold rush and um, and now we're we're going through another enormous up upheaval and displacement of our citizens we had people that have moved away and they may, may never come back home if we can build ho houses and redevelop our community to bring our tribal c citizens home that that's their place that is one of our biggest struggles right now and it takes rebuilding the whole community and the whole communities but also with the million acre fire, there were so many damages in fire suppression, bulldozers, um, landing pads, um, safety zones for firefighters. You know, there, there are these massive um, push outs bigger than this room. Um, in case a wildfire comes, they actually have a place that's safer that hopefully won't burn and, and, and damage them. Um, so the cultural resources destruction from fire suppression and fire activity is tremendous and I cannot tell you the impact to sacred sites, cultural sites, and other things. Um, but I will tell you on a very positive note that this was the most prolific um, wildflower bloom this spring than I've ever seen in my entire life. So there are some incredible benefits to this, but it's also um, a lot of trauma. Marco? A hundred years of fire suppression has turned our homelands into a tinderbox. On our reservation, we're very remote, very rural. We have one road leading on to and off of the reservation. It's not even wide enough to have a white line going down the middle. Cal Fire rates it as extremely high risk of fire danger. In addition to that, one of the primary sources of our cultural perpetuation, the hazel which we make our baskets from, was not available. The art of basket weaving was dying out because if you try to burn it, you, they'll imprison you. Two of our community members went to prison for trying to take care of the land with fire. We started out the Cultural Fire Management Council in 2012 as um, a part of the Building Healthy Communities initiative by the California Endowment. And they hired somebody to come into our community to help us identify what's the most press pressing issue in our community and so that we could try to find a way to address that pressing issue. And our community unanimously said, we need to bring fire back to our land. Basket weavers need basket weaving material, and we are at such a high risk of fire danger. If there's a fire, our elders may not be able to escape. And so we set down this road to, to bring fire back to our people. It has been very challenging. It reminds me of the pre-human history of, of our place. Before humans inhabited our place, there was a, a group of spirit beings that we call Wage beings. Uh, excuse me, Wage, the pre-human race of spirit beings. And when they inhabited that place, they didn't have fire or light. And it took all of the different um, kinds of animals in spirit form to go and steal fire and light from these beings in the sky. And that is similar to what we're doing today. 
the government holds the power over fire and who can use it. And it has taken all of us to wrestle it back from them. When we have our Trex events, we have people from the Forest Service, from CAL FIRE, from tribes to individuals to Park Service, all of these different people from all of these different entities and together we're taking fire back and we're putting it back into the hands of the people because that's what the people need. The people need to have the right to use fire. And so we started down this course. We was able to do um, our first burn. It took us a year of planning. And we're just a group of community members. We're not a formal tribe trying to do this. It's a group of community. And we was able to burn our first place. It was a seven acre burn on a traditional hazel gathering place. And it was Cal Fire that did it in cooperation with the tribe. And um, when Cal Fire came in with their inmate crew to put fire on the land, I counted how many of them are there? How many people does it take to safely put fire on the land? And there was 20. And at that day, I set my goal. We are going to have 20 trained people in our community so that we can put fire on the land. And we expressed our gratitude to this inmate crew for coming to do it on that day. But in the back of my mind, I thought, we will, our own people will do this. The following year, we was introduced to the Nature Conservancy and the head of the Fire Learning Network, uh, Jeremy Bailey. And um, he came in and um, helped us put on a Trex so that we could burn big acres. We was able to burn 57 acres that second time. And we, the year after that, we burned 167 acres. Now keep in mind that we're just a small community group. We're not the big Yurok tribe. We're a handful of people who are determined to reclaim our right to use fire. We don't have no political clout. We don't have no money. What we do have is a driving desire to protect our community from wildfire and provide the cultural resources that our people depend on. And I like to share that story, not to say, oh, you know, we're all this and we're all that, but I like to share that story to let people know that if we can do it, you can too. If you have a need to protect your homes from wildfire, there's opportunities for you to learn how to use fire safely or to make contact with people who can. You don't have to sit idly by and wait for the next wildfire to come. If you have the means, you can harden your home against it. But there's also things that you can do in the, in the, the land abutting your your homes, what they call WUI, the wildland urban interface, to reduce the amount of fuel that would bring raging wildfires to your community. There are solutions to it. There are many faceted solutions, but there's hope and there's a way and together we can make that happen. So just going to queue up a couple questions. Um, so thinking about tribal trust lands, reservation lands, tribal communities, you've all talked about experiencing fire on your homelands, on your reservation lands, your ancestral territory. And there's been a lot of conversations here around equity. Um, so thinking about partnerships, a wildfire response, post-fire resources, um, can you speak to what that looks like? for your communities after a fire, and what resources are available, how you see the community surrounding the non-native community 
and agencies and partners, both the successes or any um, limiting factors to that? We'll start with you, Belinda. Yeah, so we hear a lot about collaboration and partnership, and I'm a firm believer in teamwork making the dream work. So with the Almeida fire, which took out 2,500 structures in the, uh, Tucker was talking about it earlier, in Talent Phoenix and Ashland, um, we were called upon, I mean, we're talking here like we're the most important thing on earth, but we were called upon to restore the banks of Bear Creek for the salmon. And so Lomakatsi, which is a Hopi word, that means life and balance, and honoring our executive director here who founded Lomakatsi 27 years ago, has a lot of trust in the community. So through that panel, that the trust in the community has to be there. You have to have that credibility for the county to come to you and say, we need help. You know, we don't know what to do. So we, Lomakasi, jumped into action with a tribal workforce, an uh, intertribal workforce, a Latino workforce, a Europeano workforce. And uh, we put 5,000 pounds of seed on the ground on that two-mile stretch of Bear Creek and two miles of wattles. So again, you know, thinking about the animals, thinking about that life source, thinking about the water that we need, uh, that's where we sprang into action. It was with the Jackson County and then we're also working now in response to the Almeida fire in Jackson County, the 242 fire um, in Klamath County, where you saw that picture, that was the bootleg fire out there in the Black Hills project, which our crew helped mark about seven years ago. So, um, and then we have uh, Modoc County, um, I think that, that was the Caldwell fire, and we just suffered another big fire up in the Warner Mountains. And all I could think of when that fire was blazing, I, I was like, I need my birth certificate, but run, elk, run. There's a huge herd of elk up, up there. There's our deer up there. That's our subsistence. That's the cultural beneficial use that we have for, for the animals and for the um, environment up there. So it really does take, when you see that picture of the bootleg fire, that was a master stewardship agreement with the U.S. Forest Service, with the Nature Conservancy, TNC, which provides the monitoring, the Klamath Tribes, and Lomakasi. So there's four strong partners on those agreements. We have seven master stewardship agreements throughout this region. We work throughout Oregon and Northern California. We work with my tribe. We're doing a project with the crew right now and getting fire back on their land so they can put fire in their sacred mountain where they do their ceremonies. So again, pulling it back to that place where we come into one mind and one accord and we're practicing the right way, the right communication with each other, that collaboration is everything, that teamwork is everything. Somebody talked about mutual aid agreements, I, I believe it was the CHP. Um, Ari, it, you need those mutual aid agreements, you need to train before these crises ever hit. Unfortunately, it takes a crisis to, to bring us together like this. We should be coming together like this before the crisis. If we come together before the crisis, we put our mutual aid agreements together before the crisis, we practice these incidents before they hit us, we're going to be that team. We're gonna be that team when, we, when that crisis comes, and it is gonna come, something will happen, I guarantee you, but we're gonna have, we're gonna trust each other, we're gonna be able to build those partnerships, have agreements, know where the resources are, and know who to call, and, and know, like even Home Depot, um, you know, have an agreement with Home Depot, have an agreement with whoever you need to have agreement with, think about the large animal rescue training. I was a part of that back a few years ago in California. We trained the first ever tribal team to do large animal rescue tra training with John Moretti. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him, but he's awesome and he helped us in Chico. And so those are the type of things you think of and those partnerships that are there before the crisis really, really help. You know, lean on each other. Um, and we aren't possibly the most important living being. And you know, we need to think about that too, the elk, the fish, the birds, all those other beings that depend upon this ecosystem for life. Thank you. Beautiful. So in the Upper Feather River, we've worked for a lot of years. As I said, my dad, I'm doing, carrying on the work that he had set forth to do and the people before him. and through the Upper Feather River Integrated Regional Water Management Plan, um, known as the IRWM. We had written a water plan for the state of California for our region. It was the first um, plan that was uh, um, accepted by the state, but 
through that process, um, we had uh, uplands forests, um, agriculture, municipal, tribal, and rivers, um, meadows and rivers, and people that were passionate about all of those. And we worked for about a year and a half, almost two years, to write this plan. And the collaboration and the, the depth of the teamwork with local, county, and federal officials and just average community members was phenomenal. Um, the Plumas County Fire Safe Council has been doing an incredible amount of work in our area and has sponsored like the Plumas Underburn Cooperative. So this is a group of volunteers who are passionate about putting fire back on the ground, um, kind of like you guys, but it's, it's, it's tribal and non-tribal, it's everybody. And we have some great people and they will go out and help individual landowners clear their land, fall trees, burn it, and um, so we, we've had a great amount of collaborations, but it wasn't enough. You know, we experienced um, 10 months before the Dixie fire and the Beckworth complex fires of this summer, we had had the North complex fires, um, which burned down to Lake Orville, killing 16 people. So we were reeling from the recovery of a, a huge catastrophic wildfire. Um, and then 10 months later, experienced another devastating wildfire. So, so it's not enough. But for us, we are a tribal community that basically has been erased. And a lot of the public or people, residents, don't even know that they're in our own homeland. So we see this as an opportunity to be seen again in our own homelands. And as we're rebuilding our communities to acknowledge our presence and to develop architecture texture, de develop our educational programs. Um, and one of our goals is as we're looking at the WUIs to help protect the communities that already burned and um, to ensure that that doesn't happen again as they're being rebuilt and also the communities that didn't burn um, is to redevelop our indigenous food program. And as Margot has talked about and Belinda too, we depended on this landscape. We had nothing else. We had a huge trade system, but we didn't get trade from Argentina or from um, Mexico uh, for our major food sources or other places. And so we absolutely depended on, on where we lived. If you look at Sonoma right now and knew that you had to live here year round and support this many people, um, the current population, what would you do? And so for us, burning is a tool and it is, it is life. That's how we tend our grocery store, our pharmacy. That's how we have our ceremonies for people to get well um, mentally and spiritually. And so for us, we see the rebuilding of expanding, um, expanding the Plumas County Fire Safe Council, um, getting more people red carded, trained, experiencing TREX programs and other training things. On our own lands of 3,000 acres, we're already burning. And um, the severely burned areas, the areas that didn't burn, we're using those as buffer zones. It's like, okay, there's very little liability here right now, so let's burn up to there. And then by the time it regrows, it'll have another safe buffer zone. So we're already doing that. We started last fall. Um, and so there's so many ways that we can do it, but for us, we don't want to be erased anymore. We, we're here and there's so many, so much benefit that us as tribal people can offer the larger community. Mm -hmm. But having our own unique identity to ourselves is just as important. Cultural Fire Management Council focuses um, primarily on restoration and, and prevention. So I have um, limited knowledge of, um, of post-fire recovery. I would like to say that um, the big fires up in our area just within the last month have caused a huge fish kill because of the erosion of wildfires and so um, reseeding um, native plants and trees into um, those areas that have been moonscaped is important. Um, it also so happens that the, um, the head of the Six Rivers Forest approached us to um, 
to do some fuels treatment on an area up there that had burned about five years ago or maybe even seven years ago and we went up and looked at it and it's just miles and miles and miles of these black tree remnants sticking up and underneath those trees the vegetation has grown up to be like four feet high and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is like another wildfire waiting to happen. Those dead trees are gonna, are gonna fall down. They're gonna be dry fuel on the ground. You know, a lightning strike in the high mountain country. And apparently the Six Rivers uh, uh, Forest or US Forest Service is, is thinking that same thing. So he wanted us to come help treat that area. And so I'm like, I ask them, well, are there any successful models of post-fire um, recovery, restoration? And he said, well, not really, but I think it would be best to just run fire back through here to, you know, decrease that amount of brush. And he said that the, um, the uh, fire the fire trails that the um, that the fire suppression people use to try to contain the fire are still there. So you don't even have to build new fire trails. You just use the existing one and the roads and, and do a prescribed burn in here. And I'm like, oh, well, we can do that. So that's what I know about post-fire recovery. <laughs> thank you, Margo. So um, just want to thank uh, each of you for you know sharing your knowledge and you know for the for the audience there's been a lot of talk of resilience and survival and ability to move forward and it's represented right here that resilience so i would respectfully request we give them a standing ovation oh. for our relatives <laughs> thank you jennifer